welcome. Uh, you will see that there is a green square uh, for handouts directly below the title of this morning, uh, morning's webinar. So if you have just joined us and you have not had a chance to download those handouts, please do so. Um, you, we will be referencing them throughout the session this morning, and, um, and you, you will be uh, wanting to have them in front of you. So this webinar um, is uh, developed in partnership um, with the North Carolina Division of Social Services um, and the Family and Children's Resource Program, which is part of the Jordan Institute for Families at the UNC School of Social Work. Um, we do want you to know that in the near future, there will be a recording of this webinar available on NCSW Learn. And if you are registered for this morning's event, you will receive um, an email letting you know when um, that recording is available, so please keep an eye out for that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this webinar and why we're doing this webinar now. Uh, we know this is a topic that has been talked about a lot recently, um, but judging from how many of you are here this morning, it's clear it, it still needs some more discussion. In particular, we want to help you apply what you're learning to the real world. And we understand that working in child welfare is really, really tough. Uh, one of the most difficult aspects of, of the job is assessing and distinguishing safety and risk throughout the life of a case. Um, and because of that, um, our world, the world we work in, and the world of our families is gray. It's, it's, there are no clear black and white answers. Um, there's no one size fits all, and what might be a safety threat in one instant may be a risk issue for another family. Uh, we also know that we're implementing this new policy regarding safety planning, which might be disorienting for, for some of you and add stress. Um, it can be hard to learn a new way of doing things while still ensuring safety. So the main goal of this webinar is to give you tangible tips and tools for your practice. Specifically, by the end of this webinar, what we hope is that you will be able to comfortably use um, specific terms to help you discuss and think about safety and risk. And we are going, we want you to be able to explain how you can use specific tools in safety planning and case planning. And so we're going to be talking about safety assessments, risk assessments, and the concept of the safety threshold. So I can see that many of you have already found the um, chat pod, and we're glad to see you're all here, and um, hope everyone enjoyed the um, wonderful playlist from John this morning. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with this format, um, you can talk with us by typing into that white chat pod at the bottom, uh, make comments and questions. We'll talk about questions in just a moment. Um, a couple things to know is that you can type to everyone um, by typing in the, the main chat pod. If you need to speak directly to the hosts or to one person, such as John McMahon or Philip, who is here to help with uh, technical assistance, you can um, hover over their name and type a private chat with them. So please communicate with us if you need assistance, um, and we will do our best to help you. There are a lot of us here this morning. Um, we've got 750 people registered, and um, so you will notice that the chat pod is moving fast and furious. Um, but we will do our best to keep track of what's going on in there and provide you with assistance if you need it. So as I said, we do want you to ask questions, um, but because of the large number of folks in the room this morning, it, it's going to be difficult for us to answer every question you have. And so because of that, there will be a follow-up document um, for this webinar that um, will include um, all the questions that you have, we will take those questions, we will put them into categories because typically we get many questions that are similar, and then we will have our panelists answer those questions for you and send out the follow-up document. So please do not feel um, hesitant to type a question. We want to capture that. Um, in addition, uh, John McMahon will be uh, watching the chat pod this morning, and if we have time this after, uh, after we're finished at the end, we will try to answer as many questions as we can. John will be capturing themes for us, so we can try to answer um, groups of questions that we hope will meet the needs of most people. All right.
right, so we're going to introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Laura Phipps, and I'm going to be the moderator this morning. I am a clinical assistant professor here at UNC at the School of Social Work um, in the Jordan Institute for Families and the Family and Children's Resource Program. Um, I'm hoping that I uh, are, am a familiar face to many of you. I train both in the classroom and online. Um, and I'm really looking forward to working with the panel this morning. So I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves uh, one at a time, and we're going to go ahead and start with Linda. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Linda Clements. I'm a child welfare policy consultant with the North Carolina Division of Social Services. And, and in my position, I focus on all aspects of child welfare policy. I'm glad to be with you today. Thank you, Linda. Now we're going to hear from Crystal. Good morning. My name is Crystal Williams. I also work for the North Carolina Division of Social Services. I am a child welfare pro a program consultant and a trainer. I provide training and technical assistance to child welfare sa staff in the, in the areas of domestic violence, uh, CPS assessments, MAP, and shared parenting. Great. Thanks so much, Crystal. And now we're going to hear from Jamie. I'm Jamie Blevins. I'm a CPS supervisor with Wilson County Department of Social Services. I supervise intake assessment in home and after hours. And Wilson County is also a practicing signs of safety county. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so Linda, we've got a couple comments asking for you to turn your volume up a little bit. I think people are having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. So Philip's going to help you with that. Um, and I want you to know that we have two people also in the room today who are here to help us with technical support. Um, Philip Armfeld is here and can provide you with assistance if you're having any technical difficulties if you just chat to us. John, as I said, is in the background um, monitoring the chat pod um, and also letting us know if there's anything that we need to be paying attention to throughout the session this morning. So thanks everyone for being here and um, we're really um, happy that you're here to help us with, with this learning opportunity opportunity for everyone on the line for child welfare. And um, there will be contact information of our, for our panelists at the end of the session. So with that, I am going to pass it over to Linda, who's going to get us started uh, talking about terms and definitions. Hello again. Can everyone hear me better now? Yes, OK. Before we jump into discussing safety and risk, we will review some key terms. Getting our terms straight can be tremendously helpful when it comes to safety and risk for children. Have you ever been in a case staffing meeting and heard terms on your screen used interchangeably? Being clear about what we mean matters in child welfare. Confusion about these terms can complicate how we assess safety and risk and how we make decisions throughout the life of a case. This can lead to inconsistent decisions and even a failure to fully address all the threats to a child's safety. To make sure we're on the page, same page about these terms, you will see on the screen um, the terms that we're going to discuss. Are, the definitions are actually provided in your handout on page two. I'm just going to hit some key terms related to each of these um, words. First, maltreatment. The key words are harmful and destructive. Maltreatment encompasses all aspects of neglect and abuse. Risk of maltreatment. The key word here is likelihood. The likelihood that maltreatment will occur. Risk factors. The key words are degree and seriousness. Risk factors, some are more likely to indicate likelihood of maltreatment than others. Families with a parent who uses drugs or has an unaddressed mental health issue may involve a higher level of risk to harm to their children than a family with a lack of adequate housing, for example. But of course, it depends on the circumstances of each case. Child safety. The important point here is that a parent has insufficient protective capacities. Risk and threats exist everywhere in every household. It's a parent's inability to manage or control those threats or risk factors that can put a child in an unsafe environment. Safety threats. The key phrases here are out of control and imminent. 
We're now going to transition and talk a little bit more specifically about the safety threshold. The safety threshold definition is on your screen. In some cases, the danger is obvious. In others, it's much more difficult to see. More information may be required. The more information you have, the more confident you'll be when making a decision. Also included in their handout was the criteria for the safety threshold. When you've determined the circumstances in a family meet the criteria of the safety threshold, you cannot leave the home without developing a temporary parental safety agreement and or involving court. At this point, I'm going to hand it off to Jamie. She's going to discuss more specific questions to use in applying the safety threshold concept. OK, now that we've talked about some definitions of safety thresholds, let's practice with them some examples. When looking at applying safety thresholds, we should ask four key questions. Is the condition specific and observable? Is the condition out of control? Could it have a serious impact on a child? And is the threat imminent? Here's an example of how you may use these questions. Um, Bob is picked up by the police for drunk driving and has the children in his car. Is the condition specific and observable? Is the condition out of control? Could this condition have a serious effect on a child? And is the condition imminent? This is an example of a present safety threat. And this can be found on page three of your handouts. Now we're going to look at a different um, example of a safety threshold. And this is also found on page three of your handouts. Sandy is bipolar with su suicidal ideations. She's never acted on her suicidal ideations, but she yells, screams, and, and is combative with others. She specifically yells and screams at her children, Allison, age seven, and Mary, age 14. Sandy's way of communicating with the children is to yell at them. She yells at them to get up, do their homework, wash the dishes, and clean their room. Sandy is combative with the neighbors and yells and screams at them. The neighbors are fearful of her because of her behavior, but she has never attacked them. The children are embarrassed by mom's behavior and wish she would stop. The children do well in school, but do not participate in any, in any school activities, nor do they invite friends to their home. Allison was crying at school last month because she was being picked on by her peers who were saying her mother was crazy. OK, so now we're going to do a polling question to see if this meets the safety threshold. So if you would um, look at the four criteria and pick which one you think. Okay, it looks like we have a good number of, of participants who have responded. So we, the majority of you feel like this condition is specific and observable. So let's see if um, maybe if you had some additional information how this may have an impact on looking at your safety threshold. <clears throat> some additional questions that you would want to ask and try to find out when looking at a parent with, with mental illness is does the parent have an emotional bond and a positive attachment to the children? Does she view them in a positive or negative way? Sometimes the parent's mental health can interfere with their bond with their children, but not always. It's important to assess through your intervention, interventions with the parent and the children what that relationship is actually like. Does the mother have the ability to understand and recognize dangerous situations her children may be placed in? Does she, ha does she place her children in dangerous situations because of her combative behavior? Assessing the mother's ability to protect in mental health cases is important. We must also understand mental illness does not automatically prevent a parent from taking protective role with their children. So in this instance, just because Sandy is combative 
doesn't necessarily mean that she can't take a protective role with her children. Are the children experiencing problems as a result of the parent's behavior? How is their daily functioning? Are they fearful? Are they not appropriately supervised? What can you see that would cause you to worry if you walked away from the family and the children remained in the home? Most importantly is don't lose the, sight, lose the, the voice of the children in your interviews. Often children can be experts on their family. They can tell you what they're worried about and what they'd like to see happen. And now I'm going to turn it over to Crystal for another example. Right before you do that, um, this is Laura. I just there's a question about repeating the four questions, and they do have those in their handouts. Is that correct? The four safety threshold questions. Okay, um, we'll 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 put them back up again. But I just had a quick question, Jamie. So given the fact that on the poll we had most of our people thinking that only two of the four safety thresholds were met. Uh, what is what would that mean for the case if that was what you had de decided in a staffing? Um, I think it, I can speak for how we would handle that in Wilson County. With only two of the safety thresholds would being met, we would um, look at what safety parameters we could put in place for the children to remain in the home with safety conditions put there. Um, we we look at who can we involve in the family and and. Um, and look at how we can keep the children safely there, who can check on the children, our involvement with the family. You know, you have to be really specific with how you're dealing with um, parents with mental illness. Just because she has a combative personality doesn't mean that she's not able to care for her children. So you have to be really, really specific and get down and, and you know, like peel the onion to see what impact that's having on those kids. Um, you know, parents parents are all combative sometimes with mental health issues, but it doesn't mean that they are, can't protect their children. It doesn't mean that they're a danger to their children. So you have to do a lot more digging, and that's why we made that example, and that's why I gave you those additional questions that you want to ask when you're talking with the family and talking with others and talking with those children about what you need to look for other than just looking at that scenario, which was probably what you would get on an intake report. Great, thank you. That is really helpful. Um, and you can see that John has typed into the chat pod that um, the questions, the four safety thr threshold questions are on page two um, underneath the safety threshold definition. So now we're going to let Crystal walk us through another example um, to think about safety threshold. Okay, so um, there's a handout with the case example. This is example number three. It's a domestic violence scenario. Carol and Carl got into an argument that led to Carl pushing Carol against the table. Carl had four, Carol had four stitches above her eye because she hit the table corner. The two children, David age 8 and Carrie age 10, were present when this occurred. Carl left the home when he saw Carol bleeding but came back later that night and attempted to break into the house. Carol called the police and Carl ran off before they arrived. The police asked Carol to press charges but she refused saying it was an accident. David and Carrie say that they are feel fearful of their dad when he gets angry and he has hit their mom before, but mom tries to make dad calm down or leave. Carol says everything was a misunderstanding and Carl would never hurt her or her children. Carl admits he and Carol were arguing, but states Carol walked away and tripped over something in the floor and fell against the table. He says he has never pushed or hit Carol and the children are not telling the truth. Okay, so now we're going to do a polling question to see if this scenario meets the safety threshold. All right, looks like a lot of people are responding. We'll give you about five more seconds to finish up if you haven't done it yet. All right. It looks like there's a lot of agreement that we certainly meet the first one. 53% um, of you said that it met the condition of being out of control. 83% um, of you said that it would meet the condition um, that, the, that it could have a serious effect on a child. And then fewer folks talked about it being imminent. So yes, that looks pretty accurate.
So when you're assessing safety in domestic violence cases, there are some other things to consider. Um, first, as you know, safety assessments should be completed with each parent separately, even if they live together. And we know that the policy, the domestic violence policy, requires that there's a secondary focus of safety for the victim when we're working these cases, because the safety of the victim is very closely linked to the safety of the child. Now, some things to consider when deciding if a child is safe when DV is a factor include, do threats of danger exist? Can we describe them specifically? Is this child vulnerable? And most importantly, is the victim parent capable and or willing to protect the child? Questions to, to assess whether or not they're going to be able to protect the child include, do they already have an existing safety plan? Do they, um, what are the things that they do every day to keep the child safe? Will this parent plan with DSS for the child's safety? Have there been past efforts to protect? Can we build on those? Can the battering parent, who would be the safety threat, can that threat be controlled with a temporary parental safety agreement? And what will each parent do to keep the child safe? It's important that our agreements that we make in domestic violence cases are behaviorally specific and not cookie cutter. So saying that they will not engage in domestic violence in the presence of the children is not behaviorally specific. So instead of writing that, we need to think about what will each parent do to keep their child safe. And because our domestic violence cases are so complex, that's not all that we need to consider when making safety decisions. We must also ask the following questions. Is the battering parent in jail? For how long will they be in jail? How will he or she keep the child safe upon release? What is the plan? Is the battering parent offering to leave the residence? If they do offer to leave the residence, we have some questions to ask. Where are you going? Who are you staying with? How long can you stay? I'm going to need that contact information. What happens when you decide you're ready to go home? What will that look like? Has the battering parent interfered with the victim's ability to keep the child safe? And what is the relationship between the battering parent and the child? What is the impact of the domestic violence on the, ch on the child? Assessing this helps us know whether or not the child is safe. If there is no impact, the child may be safe. So now I'm going to turn it back to Linda, and we're going to talk about safety monitoring. And before we get to Linda, we have a, a couple questions in the chat pod around the right answer for the two scenarios. And um, I, I would love to hear your, your thoughts on that. I'm, I'm, because you know more about the cases, I guess the question would be, were the answers that the participants came up with about what you would have expected for the cases? So Jamie, you want to talk about the first one? Absolutely. It's okay. huh. um, yes, I think it was about what I expected for the um, mental health uh, scenario. And I think for Ebony's question about out of control, I think when you look at the um, the safety assessment or the new temporary parental safety agreements, it, it talks about the parent's behavior being out of control. Um, it talks about how it, it, their their behavior is, is such that if, if you walked away from that situation, you could not safely leave that child in the home. So you're not just talking about that they do have some problems in the home. It's just that if, if you physically walked away from that situation, you know that you could not safely leave that child in the home. And that's going to really be on a case-by-case -case basis. You can't just look at the scenarios that we're giving you and saying that, um, it's going to fit that picture, or that you're dealing with a parent who's angry, and that at that point in time, that parent's behavior is out of control. You're really looking at a pattern of behavior for that parent. So, you know, what I tell folks is that when you go out and do a CPS assessment, whether it's an investigation or family assessment, parents have a right to be angry because anytime a social worker knocks on your door, they have a right to be angry because they don't then necessarily want you in your life. We are an involuntary service, so I think we have to remember 
for that. So you have to d distinguish between whether their anger is at us knocking on their door or that's a pattern of behavior th for them to be angry and they're out of control when it comes to how they care for their children. They're out of control for how they're parenting their children. They're out of control in domestic violence situations or their mental health is such that you just safe, you cannot safely leave those children in the home. And I hope that answered your question, Ebony. Thanks, Jamie. And Crystal, what would you say about the domestic violence example? Did you feel like the answers were about what you would have expected from the group? They were. They were. One of the points with the domestic violence questions is, or the, the, the decision as to regarding the safety threshold with domestic violence is that we actually need more information and we need to ask more questions in order to answer certainly number four about eminence um, and possibly number two as well. And I think that's why when we looked at the poll, most people are selected one and three. Um, those were the highest numbers that we had. Um, and then those extra questions that I provided, those are things we need to ask ourselves to really be able to, to assess the other two. I think when you have a parent that's um, not really engaged with us, which it looks like the dad in this situation was, um, it does certainly raise a level of safety concern that, that we need to look at. Great. Thank you guys so much. And I see we have a few more specific questions. I do think when we, we're going to have a few more examples, and I, I think we'll get to some of those questions in the, um, in the next examples. And if we don't, we'll, we'll address them at the end. So Linda, we're going to go ahead and let you take over um, in our next session section about um, safety monitoring. Hello. I just um, quickly wanted to add my comment about the first two examples. Um, I'm not I think Jamie and Crystal did a great um, job of laying them out and describing the questions to ask. In regards to the questions from um, attendees, I think what I heard from both Crystal and Jamie was that both of these cases are probably cases where you would have safe with a plan. The issue is whether or not you would need to apply a safety provider. And I think I heard Jamie say that she felt the mother's protective um, capabilities were high enough that a temporary plan, a temporary safety provider was not probably necessary. But in Crystal's case, that needed more digging. That was a case, depending on father's reluctance, that a safety provider or some kind of restriction as access would be necessary. I hope that adds a little more concrete um, clarification to the answers. Um, so at this point, we're going to talk about, we have developed a safety plan, and we are now moving on to monitoring of that safety plan. The threats have been identified, um, and you have developed a safety agreement. The objectives of your safety agreement are on the slide. I'm not going to um, go through each of them one by one, but I want to talk about the fact that these are the objectives that your agreement needs to take into account as you develop the action items. Then, out of respect for the family, we must monitor the agreement we've developed and specifically whether or not it is achieving these objectives. Monitoring helps us to enable, helps enable us to be ready to modify or end any aspect of the safety agreement that's not necessary or that maybe is not effective. To monitor a safety agreement, we must continue to assess the existence of the safety threat. Once the threat has been addressed, we must make the decision to meet with the parent to modify and or even end that agreement. When we talk about modifying or ending um, a temporary safety agreement, we want to specifically talk about the questions on the slide. During an assessment, these same questions apply also during in-home or even out-of-home services as you're monitoring a safety threat. Has it, has it been reduced or eliminated? Have the actions been put in place that have taken care of the safety threat? Or have the caretaker's behaviors changed? Have they modified their behaviors based on services so that they are better able to deal with the safety threats? As we do this, we need to keep in mind that each family is different that the safety threat is different for every case depending on the children and their particular vulnerabilities. We we'll talk specifically about modifying a safety agreement. At initiation, it's determined that Mary impulsively leaves her child to party. She leaves six-year-old Brittany alone, often for several hours, 
to more than a day at a time. The family situation results in no adult in the home routinely performing parenting duties and responsibilities to assure that Brittany is safe. The initial safety agreement requires that Brittany stay with the temporary safety provider due to the um, threat involved. Mary's interaction with Brittany was set up to be supervised. However, Mary has um, requested that we revisit the safety plan and discuss mon modifying it. At this point, Mary has made the following progress. She has developed a plan for supervision with a suitable babysitter so that whenever Mary is away from the home, Brittany will be adequately supervised. Mary has demonstrated a willingness and the ability to arrange for the babysitter to be in the home with Brittany. At this point, Mary has met the criteria, the conditions for Brittany to return. She has identified a responsible adult to be in the home who provide, will provide care and supervision of Brittany at all times when she's not in school. So out of respect for the family, both Mary and Brittany, the safety agreement should be modified to discontinue the need for the temporary safety provider. Based on other aspects of what the findings at initiation and since initiation, the agreement may continue to be safe with the plan as you modify the need for other services, but the plan would no longer require that a safety provider be in place. Note, there is still some risk in this case, but the safety threat has been addressed. Sorting out safety and risk is difficult. It's the hardest part of our job in many cases. The safety agreement addresses the safety threat, but not necessarily all of the risks to Brittany within this home. Before I move on, I want you to I want to refer you to the handouts. Uh, some of this information is going to look familiar to those of you that attended the training on temporary safety agreements. Um, page four provides the definition for present and impending safety threats. Page five provides a table that compares present safety to impending safety and to risk. This is a more detailed table than was provided in our previous training. Um, and hopefully there are some words there on that table, I'm not going to cover it, that you can refer to and will be helpful as you discuss impending present safety and risk. What I am going to delve more into is page six. This is a table of risk versus safety. Again, as we talked about in our temporary safety planning, safety concerns are a subset of all risk concerns, but not all risk concerns are safety concerns. It is often challenging and confusing to make a distinction between these because safety is a subset of risk. But safety is concerned with present and impending threats of harm, whereas risk is concerned with assessing the likelihood of future harm. As I go through the next through comments, you might want to refer to your handout page six. Severity. Maltreatment and risk of maltreatment include any form of maltreatment without regard to the level of severity. Harm or potential harm can be mild to severe, but safety is only concerned with the harm that is severe. Timing is another important distinction between risk of maltreatment and safety. Risk is future oriented. The time frame is not specified. Risk identifies the likelihood of maltreatment that may occur in the future but not whether it is likely to occur in the next month, two months, or longer. Child safety specifies a present in the near future time frame. It is present or likely to become active within the next several hours or days. Risk is concerned with family functioning, that is, with the family's overall ability to meet a child's needs. In contrast, safety is focused more on a specific incident or condition where the parents or family condition is out of control and is currently or impending cause of harm for the child. Lastly, with regards to planning, a plan to address safety must be immediately put in place. Plans to address risk can encompass many aspects of family functioning and often include treatment over a period of time to address behaviors and the family and children's needs. In keeping with our desire during this webinar to give you some more concrete examples, if you look at your page seven in the handout, 
it provides some specific situations. Situations of improper discipline, child left alone, and gives you what you may find when you go out and initiate what behaviors to look for and what are signs of whether it is a safety issue or a risk issue. At this point, though, I'm going to transition to Jamie, who's going to talk in more detail about assessing risk and some other cases. OK, let's talk about risk when working with families. It's possible to have a high-risk case and not have a current safety threat. You may have to file a petition for a case with high risk, chronic maltreatment, and risk of continued maltreatment that has had and will continue to have detrimental effect on the child. Assessing families for the probability of future maltreatment in order to direct available resources to the family with the highest need. The process used to determine the long-term likelihood of harm to a child. It does not predict or when or how serious the harm may be, but the likelihood that it will occur. It's a continuous process. As new information is received regarding safety, risk, or protective factors, assessments should be updated. In North Carolina, it's expected during assessment, CMAPS is used to complete a thorough assessment of the family. A thorough assessment is meant to capture information to determine both the safety and risk for children in that family. It requires that the assessor dig for information and not just scratch the surface. This slide provides the type of information that an assessor must be able to truly assess. Uh, I'm sorry. This, this, this slide provides the type of information that an assessor must be obtaining to truly assess the risk for a child. This digging must continue throughout all services, including in-home and placement. Digging also involves consulting with collaterals, collaterals of the collaterals, obtaining mental health and medical records and school records when appropriate. We also need to gather any other information that would help in completing that thorough assessment. Now let's take another look, another look at a different example to practice a risk. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jan has one child, Edgar, age three. Jan has been using prescription pain pills for six years, but it is unknown if Edgar was positive at birth because he was not tested. Jan works part time, and her mother, Alice, watches, watches Edgar while she works. When she is not working, Edgar is with Jan. Jan has multiple people in and out of her home who are all known substance abusers. Jan has been known to go from doctor to doctor looking for pain medication. She is known by law enforcement as someone who tries to buy pills from the street, but law enforcement cannot say if Edgar is with her. Alice admits her daughter has a problem with prescription pain pills and says she has seen her nodding off before when she's visiting her house. Alice denies ever seeing Jane being under the influence when she drops or picks up Edgar. When asked to take a drug test, Jan refused and states she does not have a problem. Jan says she works and maintains her own residence, so any substances she may or may not use do not have an impact on her care or on the care she provides for her child. So now we're going to look at how you would rate this case. We're going to look at scaling. Um, so in a minute, we're going to practice assessing risk using a scaling question, but let's talk about scaling first. Scaling is a great way to assess perspective of a situation. As with any scaling question, you need to anchor the scale with specific descriptors for high and low numbers. You should also plan to ask follow-up questions. Identifying the number is just the beginning. The beauty of scaling is in the follow-up questions. What makes it that number? What's one small thing they can do to lower the risk? Let's give it a try. We're going to do a polling question to see how you would scale this case example. So what I want you to do is select the number that you feel best identifies the level of risk in this case. And the, the low risk is that there's no risk to the family and you can walk away. High risk is that the child is not safe and you need to file a petition. I'm going to give you about maybe five more seconds to respond. All 
Okay. So we're going to go ahead and close this poll. And it looks like um, the majority of you are kind of neutral on this particular polling question. So I guess what we can go uh, see is that um, ass assessing risk isn't always easy. Here are a few things you want to keep in mind when assessing risk with substance abuse. Research indicates that there's often more than one poten more potential negative impact on a child from ongoing chronic neglect than from incidents of abuse. When assessing risk of harm to a child, it's important to determine the ongoing exposure of a child to the environment they're living in as indicated in a change in the child's behaviors, child's emotional state, the child's interaction with others, their school performance, and even an increase in the frequency of illnesses. The ongoing impact from living in a stressful environment can be the underlying cause of asthma and or diagnosis of ADD and ADHD. So I think in looking at this particular situation, most of you are pretty neutral on, um, <coughs> excuse me, on the, um, the scaling question. Most of you are at a five. So I'm wondering whether or not maybe you guys think that you needed a whole lot more information about this situation before you could go higher or lower in assessing the risk to this child. So it seems like you had a lot of more questions that you needed answered than the scenario that we were able to give you. So you know? I just wanted to say, Jamie, just um, there's been a comment that, that people feel like they were assessing it as moderate risk um, uh -huh. as opposed to neutral, just to okay. clarify that. Yep. OK, that works. All right, so now I'm going to turn this over to Crystal and take a deeper look at the domestic violence um, scenario from earlier. OK, so earlier we used the domestic violence case to assess for safety, and now we're going to assess for risk so you can see the difference between the two. We just talked about the differences between scratching and digging. We reviewed several questions to consider. Now we're going to look at how these questions can be applied in our DV case to assess ongoing risk. If we are simply scratching the surface, scratching the surface of this case, we're focusing on Carl's current assault on Carol, the fact that the kids were present, Carol's refusal to leave the relationship, refusal to file charges, and Carl's substance abuse and anger issues that caused the assault. But this is the problem. Even if we know these things, we still don't have a, enough of a big picture, and it's still going to be difficult to actually scale the risk level. So when we dig in this case, in order to get a comprehensive assessment, we look at the bullet points that are above on your screen, digging, and how those points can be applied in this scenario are the following. These are the things that we learn. Carl has a history of using power and control with his family members. Carl does not allow anyone into the house. He controls all the money, so the kids and Carol are extremely isolated and have no support system. We learn that his verbally abusive behavior has been going on for 10 years, that this is the worst physical assault thus far, and before this assault, the violence had been increasing in frequency and severity within the last three months. By talking to the teachers, the nurses, family members, we find out that one child is, ex is exhibiting bullying behavior declining grades, one child is withdrawn and has nightmares, and both children are extremely fearful and get sick to their stomach when dad pulls into the driveway. We had an earlier question about defining impact. Somebody asked me to define impact. These would all be examples of impact. Impact can be physical, emotional, social, psychological, behavioral. It shows in different forms. And with these kids, it's showing up in their school, their social behavior with their children, I mean, I'm sorry, with their peers. Um, and it also shows up with the psychological part of being extremely fearful. We also learned that Carol is the main person who's been protecting these children. We learned that Carl threatened to kill her and the boys if she ever took out charges or filed papers on him. And that is the reason she lied at first, and that's the reason that she refused court action. Her not filing charges was actually her way of protecting herself and the children. We also learned from talking to Carol that she is willing and able to protect her kids because she's been doing it. And she's also willing to work with the agency to safety plan. We also learned that Carl continues to avoid the worker. He refuses to, he refuses to enter into services agreement. And he's actually, actually has recently reassaulted Carol. So knowing these things, the points for digging, we have a much better understanding of risk for this family. So now that you have this information, let's, let's assess it with a scaling question. Can we put the polling scaling question up? 
Okay. So on a scale from 1 to 10, 1, low risk, close the case, 10, high risk, file the petition, where would you all rate this case? All right, we'll give you about five more seconds. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close down the poll. It looks like 67% of you rated it as an eight, and I, I, would, I would tend to agree with that. The fact that um, the dad will not um, engage with us in safety planning certainly raises it. The fact that mom will engage with us is helpful. If neither one of them would engage with us, then it would probably be a high risk 10. So um, I would agree with, with the eight scoring. It, it's much higher because um, like Jamie said earlier, you know, a risk score of 10 would also indicate an imminent safety threat. It would meet that threshold. So you guys are right on point with that. But again, in these DV cases, we can't just look at those basic scenarios. We have to dig in order to assess risk. So it doesn't end there. There's lots of more questions that we need to look at when we're assessing for risk in a domestic violence case. So if we go to our next slide, I'm going to provide some of these for you. This is not all of the um, information that you need. Um, but certainly, these things are extremely important. Risk levels in domestic violence cases are higher when the battering parent is abusing substances, when the adult victim parent is abusing substances, when neither parent will meet with you, and neither parent will safety plan with you. Um, if the battering parent is aggressive to law enforcement and social workers, risk is higher. If the battering parent violates custody orders, restraining orders, criminal orders, the risk is higher. And if you have a battering parent that has already completed a batterer's intervention program and continues to be violent, that is another indicator of extremely high risk. So again, domestic violence cases require a lot of digging to truly understand and address risk. So Crystal, we do have one question about um, about the impact of the child, and wondering if if the what we're seeing from the children would be enough to substantiate an emotional abuse um, violence. So as we know, emotional abuse is very hard to prove, um, and so I think that it but it is provable. Um, if if the child is seeing somebody and has a diagnosis, is sharing these things in a clinical setting, we have documentation of that. I think certainly we. Um, we have enough to probably substantiate emotional abuse in many of these situations. I know that in my practice, we veered from emotional abuse cases because we because they're just so hard to prove. Um, so we would try to you know get, find neglect or something like that. But I, I do encourage you guys to to do the digging. If you have the information that will substantiate emotional abuse, then I think you should absolutely do it because these children do suffer emotional abuse and trauma when they're living with. Um, a person who's being violent in their house. Right. Thank you. Thanks so much for answering that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and pass it on to Linda. Uh, we have had some questions about what, where the slide is in the handouts, and this was added later. So in our follow-up document, we will make sure to get this information to you. So Linda's going to talk with us now about um, the structured decision-making tools. Okay, as we get closer to the end of the webinar, we want to talk about how to apply the SDM tools as we are making decisions in our work. The state implemented the structured decision-making tools in 2002 as a part of its program improvement plan that accompanied the first round of the Child and Family Services Review. The state implemented these tools as a means to aid social workers in making sound decisions consistently. The next slide here looks at the questions that each SDM tool 
can help us an answer as we discuss a case. These SDM tools are designed to look at a specific aspect of a family and the case to determine if involvement is needed. It's important to remember that these tools do not make our decisions. We make the decisions. The tools support us in providing support for those decisions and help us make more consistent decisions. See the slide for more um, specific questions for each SDM tool. For example, for the risk assessment tool, even if a safety threat has been addressed, are there risk factors? We can talk about the mental health problem that was at the very beginning or the substance abuse problem. Even if there is not a direct safety threat, is there a high enough risk that we need to address that and what are the services that would be appropriate to address that risk? Next, I'm going to go on to the next slide, and we're going to talk specifically about how to use the safety assessment in conjunction with the risk assessment to make some decisions. This table is also provided um, in your handouts on page 8 for future reference. So let's take the first example. Say you're staffing a case, and the outcome was safe with the plan. And the risk assessment is low. For this kind of case, we should be discussing if the safety agreement's effective. Is it still needed? Maybe the initial incident that led to our involvement was an isolated incident. We've since learned the family has resources and protective capacities that were not initially noted. If the risk is low, that there will be future maltreatment, and the family has been able to demonstrate their ability to step up and address the safety threat, in this case, our involvement should be fairly short term. Now let's look at this column on the right. Say we're getting to the case decision time. We've got a completed safety and risk assessment. And we're talking about the four decisions, the questions we're going to look when we make a case decision. I know you may not have those questions in front of you, but question two specifically asks you about is there a safety threat. Question three asks, are there significant risk factors that are likely to result in serious harm to the children in the foreseeable future? That's where your risk assessment helps you in making your decision on whether ongoing services will be needed at case decision time. Questions you should be asking is what services would be available to help the family increase their ability to mitigate this risk? Have services already been referred for the family, and did they engage with those services? What services are necessary to ensure the safety of the child? Once you've identified if there are services necessary, you need to then ask if the family became non-compliant with these services, would this put the child's safety at risk? This specific question is in your um, policy in making a decision around safety needs, safety services needed, excuse me, for a family assessment. If the answer to your question would the child be safe if the family became non-compliant is no, the child would not be safe. Services needed is the finding that should be made. DSS should continue to provide services through inv involuntary CPS in-home to monitor that family to ensure that the services are engaged in and that the impact, desired impact to build the skills of the parents to mitigate safety are learned and demonstrated. This would meet the criteria for imminent risk to a child and should be transferred to in-home services. Of course, any, question, any of your decisions that down on the bottom row here, unsafe, are probably cases that you have already involved court intervention. That's kind of wrapped up. I'm going to pass on to Jamie. Um, I see a question here. Is it? So the question is asking if the policy of the strengths and needs assessment is, is requiring that it's not done until near completion of the assessment, um, and wondering if that's going to make things challenging to get a, a holistic look at all the risk factors. Do you want to go ahead and answer that one now? 
Yeah, and I think um, when I was just talking about my last example, I was talking about at case decisions. So the assumption was that your strengths and needs and risk assessment would be done, and you'd be answering that uh, question on a case decision. Um, before the end, th end of the case, I think um, different counties do have different practices on using, especially the risk assessment. You can certainly refer to that assessment for um, looking at different risk factors to help you look at um, where you are in the case and what else you should be digging for that might impact the risk factors you've identified. Um, but it does not, the policy says you need to have them done for case decision. I don't know that it says you cannot use them before that. Great, thank you for that. Um, so we're going to just um, do a little bit of a summary about what we've talked about, and then we're going to have plenty of time for questions. So if you have questions, please make sure that you type those into the chat pod so we can make sure we get them answered. All right, so now we're going to summarize. Um, you know, when things are gray, they're often, as they so often are in our work, the fundamental, <coughs> excuse me, the fundamentals matter a whole lot. We understand it can feel overwhelming to sort out all the issues related to safety and risk. It can be tempting to find shortcuts or look for easy ways when cases are complicated. We've all been there. However, it's precisely these times when we need to rely most on what we all believe to be best practice. Remember, there are, there's more to a family than what's on the intake report. Families are complex and unique. We can't lump them into categories based on the things they seem to have in common with the families we've had in the past. Trust the foundation of our work. We owe it to the parents and their children to take the time to get to know them. Only through engagement can we get to the, head, to the heart of the, what's really happening with families. Decisions and plans only work if they're based on specific information. Just because something worked for another family doesn't mean it will work for this family. Be open to the family's input and be willing to consider, consider alternative plans. Ask the family for ideas on how they would manage their situation. They are their own, they are their own es experts on their family, and they know what will work for them. Change is a learning process that requires commitment, support, and perseverance. This applies to interacting with families and using the new forms for assessing safety and risk. Just hang in there. And looking at the risk of maltreatment and safety, so let's review a few key points that we want you to take away from today's webinar. Safety and risk must be assessed formally and informally throughout the case. Maintaining sufficient meaningful contact with the family and using appropriate collaterals are important. Don't just pop into the family and say how things are going. Each time you visit the family, it's important to engage with them about why you're involved and what's happened in their lives since the last time you were there. Superficial contacts will get you superficial information. Treat each contact with your family as a form for change. Maltreatment isn't just the things we can observe. We must also focus on the risk to the child, focus on the behavior of the parent and the impact to the child. Focus on what you're worried about by including behavioral descriptions in your assessment of the family and what that possible impact these things can have on that child. This can lead to future risk of harm. The SDM tools can be a helpful guide, but don't let them don't you let using them interfere with your assessment. Your observations and interviews with the families are the key to assessing safety and risk. Now where do we go from here? That's the big question I think for everybody. For the next steps, we want you to focus on applying what you've learned today in your day-to-day -day work. Of course, that will be a learning process, so it's important that you use available resources to help you ask questions. Here are a few things that you can do to help you apply as you learn to practice. Your safety planning with your family should be specific and describe what you expect the parents to be doing differently, not what you expect to see them stop doing. The things on the plan should, be, should address the dangers we have identified, and at the same time, they should have the buy-in of the family. Safety planning should address the safety of the child and meet the needs of the family, not the demands of the agency. Risk evaluation is the ongoing assessment of the family. Past behavior can be the best predictor of future harm. It's important to ask families how they handled situations differently in the past. This can give you insight into safety risks within the family. 
An example would be is if a child has um, bad behavior at school, and every time he comes home, dad hits him with a belt. Ask dad if he's never, has there been a time that he hasn't hit him with a belt. So what was different about that situation, the one time he didn't do it, that the other times that he did? So finding out what was different and, and exploring that with the father or the mother or whoever that you're talking about. So look what was, what was the anomalies that have occurred. And finally, the additional learning opportunities. You'll be able to review this and our previous webinar at any time on NCSW Learn or on the Family Children's Resource um, Program's website at fcrp.unc.edu. And moving forward, we, you will find other courses. Um, you'll find that other courses will be revised to reflect this content and include the new safety planning and new assessment policies and procedures. And now we're going to turn it to Laura. All right, so we do have plenty of time for questions, and we know that in particular the things that people have been struggling with around this topic is that there's there's only so much we can do in a webinar format. Um, there are case-by-case -case examples that certainly we cannot go through each case challenge, but if there are typical challenges that you're facing in assessing um, safety and risk, we'd like to be able to try to answer those for you. Um, so there's a, couple, there's a question already which looks like um, there are some counties that are removing children who test positive for meth, and I think people are wanting to know how common that is or what the policy is around that. So is there someone, what, which one of you would like to take that question? Linda, do you want to answer that one? I think that's OK, possible. Jamie's going to answer. I think that may be just a county by county decision. Um, I've heard some counties that are doing it, some counties don't. I think it, it's a discussion that because every county has their own uh, kind of rules and regulations. I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, it would, I think you would have to really assess what's going on with that family and with that child. Are there safety uh, measures that you can put in place? Can you have it safe with a plan? Um, could mom and the child go stay with someone else versus you actually removing the child from mom? You know, there's other things I think you can do if you if you look at that situation. And you know, is it in the best interest of the child and the mom to be separated at birth because the child is tested positive? You know, you, you have, every case is different, so you really have to look at it as a, as a case by case basis. I think any time that an agency or or um, anyone who makes a decision to say just blatantly that because a child has this, our decision is going to be that, you run into a lot of problems in the future because you're, you're doing the same thing um, for the same family. And I think, you know, as Freud says, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing all the time and expecting a different outcome. So you, you have to be careful with those kind of things just to make a blatant statement that if a child tests positive for meth or if it's a domestic violence case or if it's a mental health case that you're going to decide that all of these cases are going to have this particular safety plan in place. You, you really need, when you're looking at safety planning and you're looking at safety thresholds and you're looking at your case, you need to be looking at that case, not looking at making a decision based on what is alleged and what you find. Look, look at the family. Look at what's going on. You may have a child that tests positive for meth, but you may have a ton of family that's involved or safety resources that you can use with that family to put things and supports in place around that child versus just looking at the fact the child tests positive for meth. And I hope that helped. Thank you, Jamie. And there's just a quick question there on um, whether or not we're discussing methadone or methamphetamine. And I assume we're discussing methamphetamine in the example you were talking about. Yep. Is that true? That's what yes. I, I see nodding. You guys can't see her nodding, but I can. Okay. So, um, so we have a question about the domestic violence scenario. Um, down there from, from Kristen Holland. So it says, in the DV scenario, if Carl continues to not engage and Carol does not leave the home with the children, will they need to be asked to put children in kinship outside the home, or should the agency file a petition? So Crystal, you want to answer that one? Absolutely. Um, I think that one of the issues with domestic violence cases is that we, um, as child welfare workers, go to a place of leaving equals safety. And leaving does not always equal safety. Um, they don't have to leave the home I mean, in order to be safe. Leaving actually, in many cases, ups the risk to the family and makes them more unsafe when they actually live, leave. So really, the, the question is, can Carol 
protect these kids? Can she plan with you with her being in the house? We'll call with, if, he, if he does come around. Um, will he engage with you as well? Um, you know, we've talked about, um, some, in some of these cases, Carl, if we actually were able to talk to him, they might offer to leave the home. And again, there's several questions that we have to ask around that. Um, somebody could move in, um, or mom could go somewhere with the child. So I think certainly talking about possible safety, temporary safety placement might, might be something that could work in this safety situation. But then again, as we've talked about earlier, safety is about hours and days, not necessarily weeks. So it needs to be something that we could put in place right now. Great. And if and if we can't, sorry, and if we can't, and if we can't do that, then you know if people are not engaging in that safety planning process with us, then absolutely we would need to consider uh, removal. All right, thank you, Crystal. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Um, so we have a question about repeat cases. So that, um, for example, if a if a family is complying and meets objectives, and then we close the case, and then they keep coming back, um, does that increase the level of risk or the level, does that change the way we would answer the questions? I don't know, Jamie, do you want to answer that, or Linda? What do you think? Sure. I can, this is Jamie, I can, I can try to answer that. Um, I think one of the questions that I would have when you look at, when you say objectives, did, what, did it result in a behavior change? So, or did, was your service agreement just that they go to parenting and that they, you know, do check off all the boxes? So I think, you, you know, you need to look, was there an actual physical behavior change in the family? And if there was a physical behavior change in the family and it came back, then I think it, do, it does tend to increase your safety threshold for that family because obviously something didn't stick with that family. So I, I think it would up your, your safety threshold. Um, you know, one of the things that we really want to see with families is that we're writing our service agreements to make sure that you're effecting a behavior change, not just, um, you know, going through services, because I think we all agree that services do not equal safety for any child. So, um, you know, if it is a repeat case for the same information or allegations and it goes to in-home, then I do think that that does up the safety threshold. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have a question here about, um, if, if you determine safe with a plan and the plan is the child residing with another person um, and the agency transfers to in-home services, how is this in line with the child needing to be in the home when transferring to in-home? Um, if the child is not in the home and it is safe with a plan, does that mean a petition is filed and it is not transferred to in-home services? Does that question uh, make sense? You want, do you want to answer that, Jamie or Linda or anybody? Okay. Um, this question came up in some of our training on temporary parental safety agreements, uh, and there is some individual county discretion in how they handle cases when it comes to case decision, and it is the safety agreement has safe with the plan, and the plan is residing with another person. Um, the policy is that you do have to file the petition, but you have the uh, discretion to decide if you're going to take custody at that time or transfer it to in-home. The issue really becomes greater when you get to um, adjudication and then disposition. If you get to the disposition point of time and there is still no um, end in sight to that placement out of the home, that's when we would recommend you go ahead and look at taking custody if you haven't already. The um, reason the discretion was left is there was the hope that the parents, if they're making progress at case decision time, would be able to address that safety threat before disposition time, and you would not need to intervene to take custody. Um, I hope that answers the question. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. That's exactly what I was going to say. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and I think there's... Yeah, there's a few follow-ups, but I think they're all essentially asking a similar thing about if the child is not in the home, um, if the case is transferred to in-home, it says the child must be in the home. If not, a petition must be filed. So that seems to be the question that several people are asking. So I think we've covered that. Um, so there's a few more questions up there in the chat pod uh, that John's been summarizing for us. Uh, there's a question here from Gwendolyn about um, the question on page four of the in-home services agreement about uh, kinship care placement and safety resources, will that be eliminated in the new forms? 
Linda, do you know the answer to that one? Um, we unfortunately have not gotten that far in um, going through all of our forms. Um, we are looking at in-home in the near future, hopefully, um, and that should be addressed then. Uh, it will be added as of now to our list of things to do. Um, it had not been on our radar, radar, but it does need to be addressed. Thank you for that um, notice. Great. Uh, let's see. I'm looking here. Um, what is the statute for compliance petitions? Who would like to field that question? Is that well? The as as was um, reinforced by our legal, there is really no such thing as quote a compliance petition. The only type of petitions we have are your A N and D petitions or your interference petitions. What people have been referring to as compliance petitions are actually A, N, and D petitions where we did not take custody. And when we got to disposition, the court would order the parents to engage in services, essentially to comply with what um, the Child Welfare Agency had been asking. So I hope that answers the question. There really isn't a statute that it, defines a compliance petition because it's not in statute. It's an A, N, and D petition, but it's one where we do not take custody. OK. Um, thanks for that. Let's see. I'm trying to see if we've gotten most of our questions. Um, let's see. There's a comment about the domestic violence case. I think it is not, it's either a comment or a question about saying, could, it's maybe saying, could we do a petition to have Carl participate versus removing the children? Do I go with that, Crystal? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I'm just going to uh, ditto what, what Linda just said. Um, court action does not always mean removal of children. And I, and I think that some agencies are very reluctant to file petitions and not take custody of children. Um, but we certainly feel like that um, it's a step with our reasonable efforts that are required to have, you know, maybe get the court involved to see if we could order Carl to participate. That might motivate Carl to do that, and I certainly think that that would be a, um, a logical step to do before we look at um, actually removing the children. Great. Thanks for that. Let's see. I'm trying to keep track here. John's putting our answers in. Um, We've got that one. I, so we've got a question from Mecklenburg. I thought it was effective January 1st if a child cannot be in the home. I think we answered that one. Is that true about the in, child being in home for in-home services? I want to make sure that we have answered it. This was the basis of my question as some of the information received is contradictory. And I think it can feel contradictory. I think um, I a each county needs to be pretty clear if they are leaving a child um, in a safety placement and not taking custody that they've got a plan for that child to come home. And that is not necessarily something that should happen frequently at case decision time. So um, I understand where it can sound somewhat contradictory. The bottom line is that if a child's not in the home, you have to file a petition. It's whether or not you go to in-home or um, foster care placement services that the county has some discretion see, discretions decision about. <laughs> OK. Um, we have a question about sort of the time frames. The 45 days is such a short period to really dig for all the information. And in some cases, uh, by the time the case reaches this position, it would already have been in home services. So uh, how do you advise people to handle the challenges with the time frames and digging for information? Let's see. Uh, Jamie, you want to take that one? OK. I think maybe um, in, in Wilson, we practice maybe just a little differently. When we know that a child is not going to be able to go home during assessment, our, we have gone on and filed the petition for um, abuse, neglect, and dependency, because that's when the abuse and neglect dependency has, has occurred rather than an in-home. So we have filed those petitions on the front end. And then we'll send it to, more than likely, send it to in-home. Or um, you know, in rare cases, we send it to foster care. But most of our cases do go to in-home um, for those particular cases because we know that you know, based on what we've heard from from the division and the initial things, were that um, we 
you know, you, you didn't want to send a case to in home knowing that the kids were still out of the home. So we've taken it upon ourselves to do that when the kids are in those safety placements and, and file those petitions when the abuse, neglect, and dependency has occurred in the assessment phase of it. So that has just worked easier for us rather than trying to go back in 215 and prove what occurred in um, assessments. And, and, you know, usually our adjudications uh, occur within those 60 day periods, so we've been lucky in that, that, um, respect. I know some counties aren't that fortunate. So um, you know, it, it has worked for us so far. And we started doing that as soon as those um, there was talk, I think, back in June about the temporary parental safety plans. Our attorneys had a really um, strong heart-to-heart -heart conversation with us about our protections and not being protected about certain things and um, just set us down and told us what we needed to do. And that's what we started doing. All right, great, thank you. Um, there's a quick question about, uh, well, I think there's two questions that were related. So uh, Valerie asked, what did Gwendolyn mean by kinship care and safety resources no longer existing? I think she was asking about a specific box on a form, if that box would, would continue to be there or not. Um, and so, so Tara asks, uh, when will those forms be available, the revised forms, or do you have, a, do you have a, an idea of when those will be available? Uh, this is Linda. Unfortunately, I cannot commit to a specific date. I will certainly um, take that back and try to make it by uh, January 1st, especially since it is so impacted by this policy. Um, and we can make that one change, even though we do anticipate additional changes in the future to that form as we um, update in-home. Um, that's really all I can commit to at this point. Um, all right, that, that seems fair. <laughs> Um, all right, we've got uh, just a couple more minutes for questions. Um, we have had a few questions coming up about um, whether or not all these things in the chat pod will be captured, and the answer is yes. Um, so John is capturing questions, and we will be um, condensing them together so that questions that are of similar nature will be put into one category, and then we will have our panelists answer those questions, and that will come out in the follow-up document. So um, if you're ha wanting to capture all this in notes, you don't need to worry about that um, because we're going to be providing you with a written follow-up document um, that will capture the questions in the chat pod. All right, so let's see if we have a question here. Um, uh, that is different. So it says, if the case is open during the transition between December through January, should the assessment worker redo the assessment, risk, et cetera, on the new forms? No, I'd say use, uh, this is Linda, use your judgment. If you have done a safety assessment before January 1st on the old form, you would stay with the form. Now, if a new um, safety threat comes up after January 1st that you need to assess, then you might need to convert to the new form. Um, I understand there may be cases where you make the, do the complete safety assessment before January 1st, and then you're doing your case decision um, and risk assessment after January 1st. We would not expect you to redo the form at that point if you, it's already completed before January 1st. I hope that answers the question. Um, and also, we do have some questions about the final versions of the forms. I do believe that uh, because it's December 1st, uh, everything is up. And you said there was a Deer County Director letter going out that would uh, update everyone onto the, the temporary parental safety agreement forms. Is that correct, Linda? Uh, yes. I haven't actually seen if the Deer Director letter went out. It was supposed to go out yesterday or today. Um, but the forms actually have been posted. They've actually been there for about a week. So all the new forms. Um, with the temporary parental safety agreements are on the DSS forms website. They have not yet all been converted um, or translated to Spanish, so that we're still working on that, but the forms have been posted. Great. All right. Um, let's see. We've got one time for one more question. Uh, we've got, um, would it be up to the social worker and the supervisor to place children in the temporary parental safety agreement when the case is in in home. Um, if no, do we need to file a straight petition or make a new report? So who would like to handle that one? Uh, if the case is in home, the new policy says that you are not allowed or able to place in a temporary safety um, agreement provider. The only time you can do that is if you have an open um, assessment. So if you have a new report, then you refer back to the policy for 
safety um, for assessments. If you do not have a new report and this, uh, and maybe you're open for a specific safety uh, or risk factor, and it is actually escalating to the point the child's not safe, then you um, should be having a CFT and probably filing uh, for custody. All right, great. Thanks, you guys, so much for answering the questions. And like I said, we were not able to get to all of them. But please do continue to type your questions if you have them into the chat pod. Like I said, we're going to be capturing those um, and answering them in categories and sending out a follow-up document um, after we've had a chance to review all the questions and run the answers past our panelists. So here is the contact information for um, our panelists this morning. And again, we are not um, saying that you should contact them with every single question you have about safety and risk. But um, just to think about, you know, Jamie is a good contact person if you have questions about how they're handling things in Wilson County and would like to know more about that. Uh, Linda has our, is our resident sort of policy expert and can answer lots and lots of questions about that. And Crystal um, can talk with you about how things might be being uh, updated or modified in the training room um, and where you can look for sort of new content um, as they're working on that in staff development. 